Well, uh, let me uh, let me let me hit let me okay this recording. Well, welcome again to our second uh, week in the study of uh, the book of Matthew as we begin uh, uh, again a new uh, book of study. We've uh, enjoyed our time with uh, with the Pauline uh, books, uh, going through um, uh, the majority of his uh, his writings. Uh, I wanted us to kind of take a break from uh, Paul and kind of introduce ourselves to some of the other writers. And certainly the gospel, according to Matthew, is a good start uh, in the gospels coming to understand this good news that Christ, uh, the Messiah, has come into our world. So with that being said, um, we're using Chuck Swindoll's uh, insight, um, insight for Living. Uh, or living insights, I should say, and uh, in that book commentary, he is uh, very thorough uh, in his presentation. So, so as not to reinvent the wheel, I'm going to use much of what Swindoll has already uh, laid out for us as a way of introducing. And he always start with a pretty much uh, a story to kind of get us from where we are to the place where we need to be in in the uh, in the biblical mindset. And so he talks about, uh, uh, do you know the names of your great uh, grandparents? Does anybody here tonight know their uh, great, great grandparents and put them in their genealogy, uh, their genealogical order? Uh, he says, chances are that even the most avid uh, gen uh, genealogist enthusiasts among us could not trace their ancestries uh, back more than just a few generations before things start to get fuzzy. Um, but he goes on to say that with countless hours of research using the internet resources and a cotton swab in the cheek for a genetic test, you might be able to uncover your family's history back a few generations, maybe one or two, uh, and certainly um, uh, a couple of my daughters, two of my daughters had went through Ancestry.com and, and uh, did some uh, researching going back. Uh, but I'm not sure if I know anyone who can trace a line back 40 generations. In fact, Swindoll says, I'm not sure anybody would really want to. Uh, to go back that many generations into their into their past. But he says, unless you're royalty, and here he sets up for us this idea that the present royal family of England can literally trace their lineage back over 35 generations through numerous uh, uh, persons named Georges, the Georges, the Edwardses, the, the Williams, the Fredericks, the Charleses, uh, the Jameses, the Henrys, the Johns, and so on and so on. Um, they all are, are, are either buried <laughs> in, in Buckingham Palace or somewhere uh, in some other uh, well-preserved uh, crypt. Uh, but for royal families, genealogy becomes everything because in monarchies, political power isn't conferred by the vote or by achieving by uh, achieved by victory, it is inherited by birth. You must be born into royal, into the royal family in order to one day ascend to to either be the king or the queen. So it is in the opening verses of the Gospel of Matthew uh, uh, that we see this uh, uh, genealogy playing out. Remembering that the overarching purpose of this account of the life of Christ is to demonstrate that Jesus is the king, that he is Israel's long-awaited Messiah. And so it makes perfect sense then for Matthew, uh, Matthew would begin with documented proof that Jesus was not only the legal heir of the royal line of David, but also the heir of the covenant blessings uh, of Abraham. And we're gonna take a look at how this, uh, the, these names interact here in a minute. And uh, anyone who makes the decision to read through the New Testament for the first time immediately encounters a daunting challenge because right 
out the gate, the reader has to wade through this long list of names. Uh, there's one in the book of Matthew, and there's also one in the book of, of Luke. Uh, Matthew is going in one direction, uh, Luke goes in the other direction. Uh, and we'll see the difference as we get, get a little further in. But the point I'm trying to make is, and Swindoll certainly makes, is to make matters worse, most of the names are unfamiliar, and some are even difficult to pronounce. And so the first reaction of someone who had no clue about the value and purpose of genealogy and scripture is to think something like, why in the world does the first book in the New Testament start off like this? Well, I'm glad you asked. However, what appears to us to be a to be of little interest and frankly rather boring information is in fact the most fundamental starting point for a Jewish reader. Uh, th those who read these uh, words of Matthew, the original audience that read these words, uh, would have been convinced and certainly fully persuaded that Jesus Christ is oh. part of the lineage of not only David, but goes all the way back to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And so to, so to the Jewish audience, okay, if a man were to claim that he was to be, he was the Messiah, but didn't have the royal pedigreed, it would all be over if one could not trace one's lineage back to David yeah. through the line of Judah, okay? And therefore, uh, uh, for, for, those, for these opening verses, uh, if we were just to put ourselves in the place of the first century Jew and uh, imagine uh, that this individual arms are folded, uh, eyes are narrowed in uh, suspicion, uh, doubt written all over uh, your face, uh, and you want to see for yourself whether this Jesus of Nazareth is even worthy, you know, is worth considering as a candidate for the Messiah, let alone can he prove uh, his, his, his uh, birthright uh, uh, position, okay? You would want to see documented proof uh, concerning Jesus Christ. And so in these first uh, 17 verses, uh, Matthew presents us the uh, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. We're calling, Swindoll calls it, uh, the genesis of Jesus, okay? Verses one through 17 going forward. And so when you look at the first verse of the gospel of Matthew, it begins literally with the words, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ or the Messiah, okay? Uh, we know the word Christ is Latin for the, for the Hebrew word Messiah. And to qualify as the long-awaited Messiah or anointed king of Israel, a person would have, to, would have to be an heir of the promise of Abraham, number one, as well as a legal descendant of King David. Only an heir from the house or the family of David would have the credentials to reign as the messianic king. And so Matthew must establish that before he even talks about uh, who Christ is and what he has come to do on behalf of God and fallen humanity. This is why, if you will, this is why Matthew begins his gospel account with a straightforward and simple, but virtually uh, a, a vitally uh, important thesis for his Jewish readers. And that is, this is a record of the, uh, 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 of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. And so, the list of names that, be, that, that follows that become uh, Matthew's, if you will, exhibit A in his uh, presentation of Christ 
a proof that Jesus really does have the pedigree to be the long awaited Messiah. Realizing the value of the genealogical record of Matthew, we can now look at the unique way in which uh, Matthew organized this information. Uh, he, he, he didn't just present a roll of names in chronological order, like one might dig up in a public archive, uh, public archive building. Okay, no, no. Rather, what Matthew does, he divided the history from Abraham to Jesus into three clusters, uh, being divided from Abraham to David in verses 2 through 6a, and then from David to the ba Babylonian captivity, uh, verses 6b to verse 11, and from the Babylonian captivity to Jesus there in verses 12 through verse 16. So that's the, the division by which these names are presented. And we affectionate, we, we preachers affectionately uh, refer to it as uh, Jesus Christ who came down through 40 and two generations, okay? Because three sets of 14 is 42. And that kind of helps us in the remembrance of this, 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 this genealogy layout, okay? So within each of the three groups, Matthew selects 14 names, intentionally leaving some lesser known individuals out of the record, while unexpectedly, unexpectedly, including some specific women in the list. Now we were scratching our heads and say, wait a minute, what is that all about, okay? And so it is clear to the reader that this genealogy isn't meant to present an exhaustive, precise, just the facts presentation of Jesus's lineage, no. And while providing a summary of the ancestry of Jesus significant, significant enough to satisfy those who would have doubted his legal right to the Davidic throne, Matthew seems to have been even more interested in teaching his Jewish readers some things about Jesus. He wants to educate them. He wants to bring them along. And he's using some of the women in, in, in their history uh, as part of the genealogy uh, um, uh, background to, to, to subtly uh, if not overtly, set that in motion, okay? So instead of examining every name in Matthew's genealogy, Swindoll says, let us focus on some of the uh, unique features that's found in each of these three clusters. The first cluster of 14 names take us from Abraham to David. Now, I, I guess I should have, now that I think about it, should have put put a timeline in here because uh, with a timeline, you can kind of, you know, close your eyes and and, and see what, what Matthew is doing. Um, let me see if I can do it mentally with you um, on, on a straight line, okay? We have Jesus Christ in the center of this line. So, on one side of that line, we're going backwards into history, into history past. So we're 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 counting backwards, okay. And so we would say that from Jesus Christ backwards to Abraham, I'm sorry, to 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 Adam. Let me let, let me let me just stay in Abraham, okay because Matthew purposely chose not to go back to Adam. Luke does. In fact, Luke goes goes you know goes goes back to 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 Adam. Let me just stay with 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 Abraham and so I won't confuse you. So from Jesus Christ to Abraham is 2000 years. Okay? Moving forward from Abraham toward Jesus at 1000 BC is David. And so and so you can kind of get a good mental picture that every thousand years there, there was a major uh, um, uh, patriarch, 
uh, that is written. And, and, and if you memorize what patriarch was at that, <laughs> uh, uh, that, 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 that milestone, it kind of helps you um, understand the history of Israel going, going back. Okay, so if Jesus is is year year zero or year year four BC, okay, technically, then you know David is roughly a thousand years before Jesus Christ, and then Abraham is a thousand years before uh, David, okay, which give Abraham two thousand years uh, before Jesus Christ, okay. I hope I helped you a little bit on that, and so and so this, this Abraham, because I want to show Jesus. Uh, as the heir of David a thousand years earlier, as well as the covenant promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 12, or Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, okay, 2,000 years uh, before Christ, okay. And so, and so he talks about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, okay, uh, those tribes that came out of the captivity, out of Egypt, uh, under uh, Jacob, the, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, and they become, he, Jacob, I'm sorry, J uh, Judah becomes the uh, progenitor of the uh, line of, uh, of Jesus, okay? Who from the line of Israel kings were or, or was to come, okay? <clears throat> so this period also spans the time during the enslavement in Egypt, okay? So if I move from Abraham forward toward Jesus 500 years, which is 1,500 years before Jesus Christ, uh, then I'm at Moses' um, um, references within the Bible, okay? And so Moses uh, is 500 years after um, um, uh, Abraham and 500 years before David. Okay, and so the Exodus under Moses, he, he doesn't mention any of that, but it's there, giving uh, of the covenant of the law and the establishment of the tabernacle and sacrifice and the conquest of the law under uh, Joshua, all of that is included in that time references, even though um, um, uh, Matthew is not going to mention any of those names uh, other than Rahab doing the time of, uh, of the conquest of the promised land, and I'll pull that to you when I get there, okay? So, uh, so, but Matthew does focus on the, these events, these events being that he does, uh, because he doesn't even mention Moses or the law, as, this, as I stated, nor does he, uh, nor does he simply transcribes, transcribe from his source a straight genealogy of father and son. So he jumps around, uh, and, and I won't say he's picking main character, but no doubt he is selecting individuals that may have been prominent in the minds of the Jewish, uh, in Jewish hearts and minds, uh, but we non-Jews do not see uh, that that connection in 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 the names that are being uh, declared. But definitely, Matthew intentionally mentions that uh, Judah fathered Perez and Zorah by Tamar, there in verse 3. He gives that genealogy uh, connection by adding a one, of the, one of the four females in that um, uh, genealogy of uh, the life um, of um, uh, uh, Perez. He says he was fathered, he fought, Judah fathered Perez, and the other son, uh, Zorah, uh, Zorah, by Tamar. And that uh, Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab in verse 5. And then he says that Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. And in the first entry of the second cluster of names, that David fathered Solomon by Bathsheba. So at some point, he's just going father, son, father, son, and then he skips over some names uh, that gives you the impression, well, that must have been his father. No, that might have been his great-grandfather, okay? Because he's not going in each instance uh, directly father, son, father, son. Uh, he's, he's jumping over because there's more than 14 generations in that time period, 
okay, in that 1,000 year time period uh, going forward uh, from Abraham to uh, uh, to David. There's more than, in that 1,000 years, there's more than just 14 families, 14 generations. But he's hitting the highlights. And so the four women that Matthew mentions in Jesus' genealogy in verses three to six aren't just random wives thrown into the mix to prove that Matthew respected women. No, no, they're, they are key uh, to the mindset of God as well as to the lineage of Jesus. Matthew purposefully include these women. He highlights women who were probably all of gen stock, Gentile stock. That is, they were non-Jewish, okay? Which technically... Uh, in 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 African in, in in African American culture, we were we were told that uh, if your mother has any drop of black blood in her, her every every offspring, every issue from her body is considered black. Okay, and I don't know why I don't know why the man would ask Kamala, was she black? Because he he knew his dad, her daddy was from Jamaica. And but anyway, but it wasn't and 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 part of that was also part of the Jewish uh, tradition as well. And we see that in the person of of um uh Timothy when Paul um uh, uh when when Lois and Eunice uh, both Jews, Jewish women, but their father, uh, Timothy's father was Greek and had not had, did not uh, have, um, uh, my goodness, I feel like Biden. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't have my notes in front of me. Um, uh, Jackie. <laughs> Uh, Timothy, good Lord from Zion, help me, Father. That Timothy, um, whose grandmother was Lois and, and, and mother was Lois and Eunice, um, uh, uh, created a an uproar in Jerusalem because uh, the people was said that uh, this Greek Timothy was, was Paul had taken this Greek into the uh, J Jewish temple. Uh, or, the, or the, the place where the Jews were allowed to enter and uh, created a disturbance. But no, he said his mother was in fact uh, of Jewish descent and he had had Timothy um, um, uh, circumcised uh, that allowed him to quote unquote be defined as Jewish, okay? Matthew is being deliberate here when he put these Gentile females in the genealogy of Jesus, uh, not to create uh, uh, doubt on on uh, Jesus's uh, birthright or, or legitimacy, okay? Because all of them entered the messianic line. These four women all entered uh, through uh, a less than ideal means, okay? How they got there. Uh, it was problematic. For example, Tamar. This is not uh, this is not Abnon's sister uh, or David's daughter. This is this is the first Tamar uh, back earlier in Genesis. Tamar feigned being a prostitute in order to sleep with her father-in-law. Okay, and 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 actually had a had a child by uh, by uh, by Judah. That's what the the, the genealogy says. Okay. He, 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 in the procreation thereof, they brought forth a son, Perez, okay? Rahab, as you know, was uh, from the city of Jericho and was a prostitute prior to being incorporated in the community of Israel. She, uh, she had um, uh, made arrangement with the spies that came into um, um, uh, Jericho that uh, she would present uh, would would uh, protect them and hide them if they promised not to kill her and her family, but rather uh, when Israel would take the city of Jericho that they would uh, uh, protect them. And they did. And Joshua honored his promise to them going forward. And Rahab uh, became uh, the wife 
uh, and, and part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. And then Ruth, as you all well know, uh, came from, Mo uh, from Moab. Um, Rach, uh, Ruth and uh, uh, Oprah, uh, when their husbands died, Naomi went back to Jerusalem and, um, and uh, was going to leave Ruth in Mo Moab. And, um, and uh, Ruth has this famous saying that she says in scripture uh, that your God is my God, your people are going to be my people. And she followed uh, uh, Naomi back to Jerusalem and uh, Ruth, um, uh, Naomi told her how she could, uh, uh, what she needed to do uh, to get the attention of Boaz. Y'all know that story. That's a beautiful story going forward. But my point is that she was not a Jew. And then we all know, we all know uh, the uh, the incident uh, concerning Bathsheba, how she became uh, the wife of David only after David had committed adultery with her and had arranged uh, for a husband to be killed in the heat of battle. So as we think about all of this, each of these women would have been viewed by the pious Jewish readers as, as being tainted or stained in some way, which then would have caused them to um, uh, uh, pass uh, uh, doubt and dispersion upon the, the rest of the lineage going forward, okay? But here we can ask the question, why is this observance so important for us? Why was Matthew, try, what was he trying to demonstrate by going through uh, and, and including the, the, the women into the genealogy of Jesus Christ. One commentary that uh, Swindoll uses says it this way, he says the presenter, the presentation or the presence rather of these four persons in the lineage of the king emphasizes a genealogy of grace. Wow, which which really rescues all of our families because uh, we all have some black sheep in our family. We all have some less than desirables, if you will. Um, uh, some Ray Rays, some Pookie, some, uh, some, some scandals, et cetera. But because of their scandals rather than their admirable pedigree, none of the women fit comfortably into the family of the Messiah. But then again, None of us do either. We we might even be the black sheep of our family, you know, as as quiet as it might be kept. Okay. But but to literally put out in an official document that the and, and this and this was true. I mean, he could have overlooked those women, uh, Matthew could have, but the Holy Spirit is saying, listen, you know, there, there, there are those who have family trauma. There are those who come from uh, broken homes, et cetera, et cetera, that have had um, incest, uh, rape, and, and, and deception, et cetera, going forward. Uh, but God is a God of grace. This emphasizes a genealogy of grace uh, extended to us going forward. And so in the first cluster, so now in the second cluster of 14 generations, Selected by Matthew includes such major figures as Solomon, uh, who built the temple in Jerusalem. There's Rehoboam, uh, uh, who, uh, under whom the kingdom split uh, between the north and the southern kingdoms, the north being called Israel, the southern kingdom being referred to as Judah, uh, Uzziah, as well as Hezekiah. So all of these individuals uh, are, are defined there that in that first cluster, Matthew adds the name of four women who had been grafted into the family of Jesus Christ despite their Gentile background. But now in the second set of 14, Matthew intentionally omits the names of four men who appears in the more precise and detailed Old Testament genealogy. When you go back and look at the uh, the prominent kings, uh, uh, well, uh, when I say prominent, um, um, uh, those who are, those kings that were uh, 
um, 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 more have, have more written about them than let's say some of their predecessors. Um, Matthew don't even mention the names of these four kings. He doesn't even mention uh, as a as a as a uh, He doesn't mention Joash, uh, who grew up as a boy and, and became a great king. Uh, Amaziah or Jehoiakim, who was the last king uh, before the Babylonian Empire and was 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 taken and killed. So 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 Matthew chooses not to even mention them in that second cluster of names. And Matthew's rationale for dropping these four names may have related uh, either to their insignificance or to their infamous character. Uh, you know, but 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 only the Holy Spirit knows why uh, he led Matthew to include or disregard uh, certain names going forward. But in any case, a genealogy doesn't need to include every single ancestor in order to demonstrate one's legal lineage. It was acceptable practice at the time for genealogies to skip generations. And it seems that the importance of maintaining the 14 generations in each cluster prompted Matthew to make decisions regarding intentional omissions from the list. That is the history leading up to the exile in Babylon uh, includes decline, uh, de degeneracy, de degeneracy, apostasy, and idolatry, uh, ultimately ending in defeat, destruction, and deportation. And so those are some of the names that were closely associated there with. Uh, he might have been led by the Spirit not to include those names. Again, he's looking for a neat way of describing uh, each cluster with 14 names. So after things fall apart in the, generation, gener uh, the generations leading up to Israel's deportation to Babylon, the history of God's people decline into obscurity. And we hardly know the people named in that third section of the third year, the third cluster of this, uh, this genealogy. Certainly we can read about Zerubbabel, uh, who took the lead in the return uh, to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. We know about that and defined in Ezra uh, chapter five and verses one and two. But the rest are just names uh, uh, written um, um, there, there is, there is two recordings of names. Uh, one is in the first and second Kings. And then there is this other book, um, uh, of first and second Chronicles. And, uh, that is a detailed person by person, father, the son, father, the son, father, the son. Now, if you really want to get into that and define what names Matthew left out, then you obviously can do a word search and have both of those uh, books uh, one next to each other on a, on on a split screen, where you can go down the the Gospel of Matthew and then the books of uh, First or Second Chronicle and see which names are omitted. Now I don't know what doing that would 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 profit you, but uh, that's available if you want to do that. But um, but again, we we read about Zerubbabel. Uh, in uh, in the book of Ezra, uh, coming back from the Babylonian captivity, um, in picturing the four centuries of prophetic silence leading up to John the baptizer's cry in the wilderness in that first century, we can imagine uh, quiet, pious Jews living in and on the land of Israel, uh, eagerly longing for their Messiah. So, so when um, uh, the last book written uh, is uh, Malachi, uh, closes out the prophetic uh, books of the Old Testament, and there is 400 years of what man calls silence, but God is still at work. Uh, the times of the Maccabeans, the intertestament, uh, testamental period uh, before John comes back. Uh, the first of the New Testament prophets uh, proclaiming 
um, uh, to repent, uh, cry, repent, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, repent, for such is the kingdom of heaven, uh, repent uh, and, uh, and be baptized. So all of that uh, is culminating, but, but, but Matthew records uh, what we needed to understand in each of those three clusters. So as the royal line passes from generation to generation, under the radar of successive oppressive nations, we went from Babylon to uh, Persia, uh, the Greeks uh, became empowered, and then they fell to the Romans, okay? Candle of the messianic hope would continue to flicker until its enduring flame set the torch of the messi of, of the Messiah ablaze. That's that's Swindoll's poetry, y'all. But Matthew notes, if you will, the final generation in a particular way that demonstrates Jesus's identity both as the legal heir of the royal line of David and as a child born of the Virgin Mary, without having physically descendants from Joseph. And here is what Matthew 1 and 16 says. And, and it says, and, and, and Jacob brought forth Joseph, the husband of Mary, from whom, and here's the, here, here's the, here's the, here's the, uh, uh, the Greek uh, shift from, 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 from masculine to feminine, okay? From whom was brought forth Jesus, who is called the Messiah. And so they mentioned two men. Joseph's father's name was Jacob. Not not the famous Jacob, just Joseph's father. We're we're in the we're in the we're in the New Testament now, and you'll find a lot of folks were called Jacob. Uh, not too many were, were named Jesus. There was a few named that were named Jesus as well, uh, which is a derivative of Joshua or God saves. Okay, so there were several other Jesuses, persons named Jesus, but but Joshua and John, uh, those names were quite quite prevalent going forward. But, but, but Jacob brought forth, which is the father of Joseph. And then it says, th then the statement is telling us, Joseph is the husband of Mary. But then this phrase, from whom? This idea of whom refers back to the nearest antecedent, which is the noun Mary. Okay, so the whom refers to Mary and not Joseph. From whom was brought, what was brought? From Mary was brought forth Jesus, who is called the Messiah, okay? And then don't miss that because you would think that we're going from man to man, father to son, father to son. Until you get to verse 16, you go from father to son, Joseph, and then you go from the husband of Joseph, from Mary to Jesus, and a lot of people miss that and think that, well, no, Joseph was his, was his earthly father, uh, was his father. No, earthly or not. And that there's some words that, that, that we're going to look at again real quick. So a few things are, are, are noteworthy about the way Matthew phrases this relationship. And I think I about said it all going forward. So previous entries in the genealogy connected names like Abraham and Isaac, okay, the father of, Ab uh, of Isaac was Abraham, or Jesse is the father of David, and they're connected with this Greek word geneo to indicate that the first person literally brought forth the second person. That is, he becomes his ancestor, okay, going forward. Even when women are named in this genealogy, it is clear the way Matthew brings that out, that the man was considered the ancestral source through normal procreation. For example, it says that Boaz brought forth Obed by Ruth, okay? So that, uh, so that there's no doubt that Boaz is the father of Obed, 
and Ruth is Obed's mother. However, Matthew describes the origin of Jesus in a way that disconnects his physical generation from Joseph and instead links it to Mary. How is that done, Reverend? It's, it's, it's in the original language, and that's why we miss it in English. It's in the original manuscript because he would have to he would have to explain this uh, to the Jews um, that uh, that 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 the connection between um, uh, Jesus and and both parents Mary and uh, Joseph. So in 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 in, in, in uh, chapter one verse sixteen, Matthew says that Joseph was the husband of Mary, from whom, whom is connected to Mary and not to Joseph, from whom Mary is the whom, Jesus was brought forth, still using the term Genoa, Juneo, okay? So that's that same uh, connecting verb uh, uh, or, or yeah, verb that was used uh, in previous uh, texts. And so this tiny Greek phrase, of from whom ek has, ek has, translated in English, from whom is used, it uses the singular female relative or relative pronoun, which makes Mary the sole source of Jesus's physical origin. So, 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 so Matthew is clearly making that distinction because he's going to introduce the question, because the question will be asked, so where did Jesus come from? How can this single uh, married, uh, or I'm sorry, well, they were, they were engaged, betrothed, but they were not quote unquote married. Uh, how then is that, you're going to explain that uh, to us, uh, Matthew, going forward. And he's going to take great pains. He, Matthew, is going to take great pains in delivering unto us this idea of virgin birth. Okay, and when we get there, we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk about Gabriel, uh, the 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 angel, etc. All of that uh, would have been uh, familiar to the mind of the Jew who would read what Matthew has written. Okay. Uh, Joseph, however, is called Mary's uh, uh, aner or honor, which is in English referring to, 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 to translate it as husband, making Jesus the legal, though not physical, son of Joseph. And because Mary, Jesus, and because um, Mary and Joseph Though betrothed, in the eyes of Jewish tradition, they were quote unquote married. Okay, um, 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 any any issue from 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 Mary's uh, any offspring would automatically be connected as being a child of Joseph. Okay, and thus the heir of the Davidic throne. Uh, and I have to, I should have checked this, if I'm not mistaken, both Mary and Joseph are of the tribe of Judah. I'm going to have to go back and, and verify that. Jackie, can you check that? Uh, let me see. Where would that, where would I find that? Let, let me, let me check that. And, um, but I think that's, that's really the, 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 the connecting point, uh, even though, uh, Matthew is saying that Joseph did not participate in the birth or, or the conception of, of, uh, of Jesus. Uh, nonetheless, uh, because of Mary's bloodline back to Judah um, and Joseph's bloodline back to Judah, they both would have, but I have to verify that. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling some information from off, off, of my, off the top of my head and I don't want to do that. <laughs> without verification. <clears throat> so Matthew then ends his stylized rendering or rendition 
of the Messiah's genealogy from Abraham with a summary statement noting that he intentionally limited each of the three movements to 14 generations. So in its most technical sense, the Greek term rendered generation can mean an actual physical descendant from one person to, an, to another, that is in the sense of the generation from a father to a son, and that's normally defined as 20 years, okay? Sometimes 25 years, depending on, on who's doing the counting, okay? Uh, but this idea from generation to generation uh, does not necessarily mean 20 or 25 years. And we know if we just divided a thousand years from Abraham to David, uh, we're going to find, you know, in that 1,000 years, uh, more than 14, quote unquote, fathers and sons uh, in direct line of, uh, of, of descending. OK, however, it can also mean a period of time, OK, from one generation to the next is, is one of the Old Testament, one of the New Testament phrases. Just as we might say back in my parents' generation, things were similar, okay? Now, this appears to be the way Matthew is using this term in verse 17. He's not literally talking 20 or 25 years from father to son to father to son. Uh, he's skipping over some grand, grand, grandfathers and great-grandfathers when he says that 14 generations passed from Abraham to David. So again, we know that's more than uh, 14 generations in a thousand year time period. And then from David to Bethlehem, there's obviously more than a, uh, 14 uh, uh, sets of families produced in that same time frame. okay? As well as from Babylon to the Messiah again. But, but, but it's believed that what uh, Matthew is doing for us uh, to arrive at the number 14 for each of these eras, Matthew appears to have connected David's pivotal reign itself as both the end of the first era and the beginning of the second uh, um, uh, set of clusters, okay? It's almost as if he's counting David twice, okay? So this division of these three clusters into 14 ages or eras, or eras, was entirely Matthew's doing. He would he 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 literally did this as a way of helping in memorization, uh, because again um, the Jews were keen on reciting a long list of genealogy who begot who who begot who, and we see that uh, list in in First and Second Chronicles. We can see part of it in First and Second Kings that who's the descendant of who, going back to prove their uh, their birth rights, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So this idea of dividing these three clusters into 14 ages or groups or eras was entirely Matthew's doing. So Matthew may have derived the number 14 from the Hebrew spelling of David's name. And in Hebrew, David's name is, 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 is defined by three um, uh, Hebrew characters, uh, three Hebrew characters, characters, with the first and the third character being the same, with the one in the middle uh, being different. Um, let me see. I think I, I I couldn't burn it out of the uh, out of the book, but Swindell had a copy of the Hebrew letters. So David, in transliteration, was DVD. Okay. And the numerical equivalent or, or, or value of that name was four plus six plus four, which gives us um, a, a value of 14. So in the Hebrew language, the letters in the alphabet have numerical value uh, to the Jewish mind, okay? And these three letters, okay, of DVD, to spell out the name of David, that made up David's name in Hebrew, had the value, the numerical value of four, six, and four respectively, and thus together uh, made up a total of 14. Now that's Swindoll's take on that. And certainly uh, uh, without writing a thesis on, uh, a doctoral thesis on, uh, on how that uh, transpired, uh, I'm gonna take Swindoll's word for it, uh, <laughs> that uh, 14 is divided up that way. 
according to what uh, what David wanted. I'm sorry, what uh, Matthew wanted us to, to when know. you ask about the lineage of Joseph. Yes. Um, Joseph and Mary <clears throat> were distant cousins. So that they, they would both be They, from they were grandchildren of two separate brothers that were both in the lineage of Abraham. Okay, well, I know Abraham, but what about jo uh, J uh, Judah? To David, yeah, to David. Okay, great, all right, then yes. we good. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, so, so from that line of David, these two brothers uh, were uh, both their grandparents. Gotcha. So that's how that's how that lineage kind of yeah. hooked up. Right. I do remember rem remember the professor s stating that, but I couldn't. It's been a while. I couldn't remember if, in fact, that was a, a true statement. But it just makes sense that the Lord would do that to shut down any pushback from the Jews that, well, why is he from Judah and she isn't, or vice versa, she is and he isn't, but nevertheless. So what is the message behind Matthew's clever device? Well, Jesus is the second David, that he is the long-awaited Messiah who was to restore the power, glory, and the kingdom promised to the first David that in arranging his genealogy, Matthew wasn't merely presenting dry historical facts. No, Matthew also embedded important theological truths using rhetorical devices that his fellow Jews would have caught. They would have noticed what he was doing when he came up with this uh, neat uh, symmetry of 14 to 14 to 14. Okay, And throughout the book of Matthew, we will see that Matthew repeatedly invites his readers to go beyond the surface level of the narrative to think about who Jesus is by examining Old Testament patterns and prophecies, Okay, and then ultimately to see the truth that Jesus is King, Israel's long-awaited Messiah. Aren't you glad about that? So here we be at the end of this first uh, course. Again, they're they're smaller, kind of kind of together. We don't we don't have to go to nine thirty, uh, but there's an application to life that I think uh, I wanted to share when I read through it. The the genealogy of grace. Again, uh, we don't we cannot pick our our family. We cannot pick with to whom we we're, we're born. Uh, when we were born, how we were born, where we were born, um, uh, with all of our limitations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, but there is this idea that uh, we're fearfully and wonderfully made and that God's grace is sufficient to take us to wherever we need to be. So with the exception of Jesus himself, every person in this list in this genealogy was a sinner, frail and foolish. Each one from the very well-known to the virtually unknown had a life that was marred by sin and guilt. We cannot name each one's sin, but there is enough historical fact that we can pull some names off this list <laughs> and uh and, and fool with folks you know in, in fact won't I just instead of messing with uh Abraham Isaac won't won't I just start calling the role at Ebenezer won't I just tell folk what I know about you each folks let me let me who's online let me let me see if I can get in folk business uh those who are who are not who have their avatar up let me see if I can get into folks business. Don't do that, Reverend. Don't do that. Uh, but we know because we 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 definitely know about Abraham's uh, deception. He he actually told the king, uh, the Pharaoh in Egypt, that uh, that Sarah uh, was his sister and not his wife. Well, kind of half true because she was his half sister. You have a hand raised. 
I'm sorry, I cannot. I have no visibility of who's talking. Go. I said me. I'm saying that there that someone has their hand up. Yeah, it says Ruth. Ruth Curtis raised her hand. Go, Ruth. Yes, I have a question. Um, I'm looking at the slide that was, I guess, after the application, and you said that uh, Jesus is second David, and I think you also said that Jesus was our second Adam. No, no. I'm not using Adam name nowhere in this. No, no, not in this, but I mean in 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 the past I've heard it. Is that no? Well, yes. Uh in 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 in, in Romans, uh it refers to let me see if I can go back. It refers to you mean before this slide here? Well, not, uh, uh yeah, about Jesus the second David. I think I'm saying one time yeah, I right here. in preaching that. Jesus all supposed to have been the second Adam? Yeah, okay. that's in Romans chapter 5, verse, is that verse 19, Jackie? Where it says that by one man, Adam sent into, into the world, then by the second Adam, Jesus Christ. It's 519. 519, Romans 519, that by the second man, uh, obedience, the second Adam, uh, all were made, uh, you know, alive. Okay. No, no, I'm the basically pastor. I'm just going by remembrance of hearing saying that Jesus was the second Adam. And now what That's I'm true. saying is just it being brought to my attention that Jesus is also the second David. That's all. Yeah, what they're saying in, in that reference to Jesus being the second Adam is because Adam disobeyed God, but Jesus obeyed. So they're making a comparison between the first Adam and the second Adam. In this reference, the first king and the last king. So Jesus, I'm sorry, David is the first uh, king of Israel, even though Saul, you know, was crowned, but the kingdom was taken from him. Uh, so he disqualifies himself, okay? Because he too old disobeyed. And the, the last David that's going to sit on the throne of David, I don't know why I didn't turn that thing off. <laughs> It's good. Go keep going. Just keep talking. That the uh, that the the last Adam, I'm sorry, the last David or the second David is going to sit on the first David's throne, and Matthew is going to actually say that he's going to say that uh, about Jesus, who is uh, uh, under him is given the house uh, of of Jacob, the throne of David, and the kingdom. Um, I can't remember the kingdom um, of Judah, uh, all of which uh, Jesus fully qualifies uh, as the Messiah going forward. So yeah, that's that was a good question. Uh, okay, please. thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, but we know about Abraham's deception going forward. He 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 mentioned that uh, um, his wife um, talking about Sarah. Uh, was his sister and not his wife. And so the Pharaoh uh, uh, attempted to take her. And then, you know, they had to fight to, to rescue uh, Sarah from the clutches of the Egyptians going forward. Um, and then um, Judah conspired with his brothers against uh, Joseph. We know the whole story of how Joseph, with his coat of many colors, uh, caused his brothers to be jealous. Um um, uh, the truth of the matter, it was uh, Reuben, the oldest brother, and uh, Reuben, and uh, it was Reuben and one of the other brothers. It was actually Judah that intervened on behalf of Joseph and said, don't kill him, because the other two wanted to kill him and take his blood, shed his blood. But Judah, which we can say is God coming to our, Jesus coming to our rescue, Judah comes to the rescue of Joseph, not to set him free, but to convince his other two brothers or three brothers uh, to sell him to the, the Midianites that were on their way down to Egypt and not to kill him. And that's that was providential because as Joseph goes into Egypt, the Potiphar incident, the Mrs. Potiphar uh, conspiracy, et cetera, he becomes second in command going forward. But it Judah was, was, was part of that. It was Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Reuben wasn't in on that? No. Oh, I'm sorry, Reuben. I didn't mean 
<laughs> oh, wow. I'm going to have to explain that when I get to heaven. Why did you lie on me, Lundy? I said, okay. And then the Tamar, again, with Judah. And I can't remember the exact uh, details. I, I wasn't planning on talking about each one of them. I thought I didn't, I didn't know I was going to end this, this quick. Um, but Tamar wanted, uh, she wanted something and Judah was ignoring her. You know, the father was ignoring her. I don't think it was the married one of the sons or whatever, whatever. But uh, as the story unfolds, and I'll have it right for you next week. But Tamar uh, disguised herself uh, and, 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 and let her head down and put, put, put braids in it and put little seashells in it. And she looked different. And uh, Judah saw her. He he liked what he was looking at, didn't know it. I think she was his daughter-in-law. He didn't know what he was looking at. Next thing they know, she comes up pregnant and, and he's all upset. Who's the father, whatever. And when she lets her hair back down and, and take that veil off, <laughs> Judah recognized, oh my goodness, I'm the one that fathered it. So yeah, it's, oh yeah, the Bible got stuff in it that you thought your family was messed up. And she uh, and was his daughter-in-law. I'm sorry. She was his daughter-in-law. Right, that he had uh, had uh, a relationship with going forward. Uh, we know about Rahab, um, um, uh, that 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 hit, held that that hid the spies going forward. But her name is in the book, and everybody know uh, that Psalms 51 was written because of David's indiscretion with Bathsheba. And then when David was given the prophecy from, from, from Nathan and said that there was a man in your kingdom that took this woman, did all these things to her, and he says, said, tell me who it is, and I'll punish him. And Nathan says, you're the man. <laughs> You've done what you have, uh, have, have, have passed judgment on, et cetera, et cetera, going forward. And then Manasseh uh, is believed to be the one that had killed the prophet Isaiah, and cut him in two with a sword, et cetera. And uh, the son of Hezekiah uh, became uh, wicked uh, and caused the other people in Israel, uh, in Judah rather, to be wicked, okay? The, note, the one thing to note about the kings, the way you can keep the kings in your mind is that every king in Israel, in the Northern Kingdom, were wicked, to include one queen, um, Athaliah, as wicked as the days were long, okay? And there were like five different dynasties that struggled to maintain those 20 to 25 kings uh, throughout the history of Israel. Uh, but Judah, all of those kings were related to each other by blood, okay? Some of them were good, some of them were evil. Asa was good, um, uh, Jehoshaphat was good, but there were some... Uh, that were not considered uh, following at the footsteps of the Lord. And uh, that's another Bible study, just, just comparing the kings of Israel uh, going forward. So this on again and off again, half-hearted faith and obedience of the tribes or the line of Jud Judah's kings, okay, them alone, amen, trying to keep them in line going forward uh, became uh, challenging and daunting. So what does this list again tell us? That is that God's grace, all oh, the amazing grace of God, that God's grace uh, excludes no one. Uh, no one is beyond uh, the pale. No one is so wicked that the, that, the, that the grace of God cannot reach way down uh, and rescue you from your uh, situation. If these men and women could be included in God's past story, okay? Sinners like you and me can certainly be included in God's present story. So just 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 keep your hand in in, in the hand of the Lord, uh, keep keep your eye on the prize and keep marching onward to Zion because humanly speaking, nobody deserves a place in Christ's legal, and physical family line. Likewise, none of us deserved a, uh, a branch in his spiritual family tree. But thanks be to God, in Matthew's genealogy, it reminds us all of God's amazing grace 
that we, as, as the children of God, that we are heirs of God and we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm happy about that. So that's the genealogy. To next week, we're going to get right into uh, the idea of this servant, uh, Jesus Christ, who has come uh, to give us uh, life. But before we can do that, he we have to convince uh, Joseph uh, that he has to do the right thing. So we're going to talk about standing in Joseph's sandals, okay? Would you do some of the things that Joseph did, positive, positive things that Joseph did, knowing the story that this young lady is going to tell you uh, who, her, who her baby daddy is, <laughs> okay? Lord, help us. Comments or questions? Okay, Jacqueline, you can stop recording. <laughs>